So I'm going to be introducing Dante and the Divine Comedy tonight. One way of getting into Dante, there's many ways to get into Dante, there's many ways to read Dante. Um, Dante should be, if you haven't read him, um, I'm hoping tonight we'll kind of sell you on it a little bit. Uh, Dante should be like visiting Paris for the first time. Just, you got to assume somewhere in your soul you're going to be back. And that you can't do it all, and you can't see it all, but do a handful of things or a few things well and enjoy it, right? Uh, so the hope is that no one reads Dante once, but that people revisit Dante over the course of their life. But only if they find it accessible or, or feel on some level that it might be for them. A lot of times the great books are too high and behind the shelf and they feel like they're for someone else or for someone who studied English for too long in his life. Um, and they're, they're not, they're for everyone and it's sort of like an inheritance that I'm, I'm eager to try to encourage others to, to receive. So Dante, just some, some historical context to get us going. We're in the 13th to the 14th century. At this time in Italy, Dante's from Florence. Has anybody been to Florence? Quite a few of you. Fantastic. Beautiful city. Not the largest city in the world. You can walk all over it in a day, more or less. Um, Florence at this time, in the, uh, in the late 1200s, early 1300s, Florence at this time, is, it's a walled city, like most medieval cities, uh, easy to defend. Um, but Florence is, is a small city, and cities in Italy at this time are worlds unto themselves. People wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as Italian. They would identify themselves as Florentine, or from Milan, or, or from Rome, right? They identified with their city like maybe a contemporary uh, person would identify with like their sports team in this city. It really matters. It's a little more local. Because it's more local, the uh, loyalties and allegiances are more intense. And if, if you were in Florence at this time, it would be the kind of experience of almost like growing up in a small town where everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows everybody's business, and everybody knows everybody's family business for <laughs> generations. So it's an incredible experience. You wouldn't have to ever talk to someone to know almost everything about them because everyone else does, right? So I don't know if anybody grew up in a small town. I did kind of back east in Connecticut, small, very rural town. And uh, you know, in the small town, you're like, I got to get out. It's too much. It's, it's claustrophobic. Uh, but at least my town didn't have a wall around it, making it actually uh, a little claustrophobic. Now, at the time, obviously, this is well before electricity, and with that nice Mediterranean climate, you are going to be outside all the time. And so the city's not just um, small and, and known and generationally deep, but everyone is seeing each other all the time always walking around, even if you visit you know, Italy or, or many cities right now, one, two, three in the morning, people are just out. They're just out. It's just the, it's the kind of weather it is, kind of city it is. And so life in Florence is life outside, where people are always seeing each other. Uh, if you remember maybe the beginning of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, set in an Italian city, Verona, right? And uh, everyone's just walking around, and uh, everyone knows way too much about everyone else. So everyone's very aware of all the rivalries between families, and there are insults being thrown. If you remember the opening of Romeo and Juliet, Spoilers, sorry. Uh, insults are thrown and someone stabbed and dies, right? That would have been very common in Florence. Because the allegiances are so intense, because they're generationally deep, Florence was known in its time for being a hyper-violent place to be. Um, so if I insulted you, I wasn't just insulting you, I was insulting generations of your family in full knowledge. So it would almost be like a walled city with Hatfields and McCoys only, right? You, everyone has a side somewhere. Now, those sides may be local families and their histories, but oftentimes it broke along two particular political parties, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Dante's family is a Guelph family, um, and when he's one year old, uh, when Dante is only one, uh, the Guelphs uh, defeat the Ghibellines in a battle. So these rivalries weren't just like, ah, oh, I don't like you, Democrat or Republican. These rivalries were like, we literally are going to fight a war in Costa Mesa tomorrow. <laughs> and they did. And so Dante fought in several actual battles in which he killed neighbors of his because they were on the opposing political side, right? So it's a super intense, rivalrous, factious city in part because whatever political party is in charge literally is going to run the city 
They can redo the laws. They can rewrite everything they want. And they're going to put all their people in power. So if I got in power, I'd be like, you're going to be a, this, you're going to be that. And we have guaranteed incomes. And it's like a nice little sort of mafia, right? <laughs> um, and so it's like whoever's in power, it's not, it's not just, an, well, in a few years, we'll vote you out. You know, That's not happening. Whoever's in power is truly in power. And it can go for generations, right? Uh, those offices will be passed down to the kids, not because someone elected the next person or whatever. So it matters in a way that might be hard for us to fathom on some level, but it was deep. Those factions were deep. When Dante is won, though, the Guelphs do win, and so his people are in charge. Uh, Dante himself will get so high up in the city, he'll ultimately be basically the top sort of governor of the city for a moment in his life. His family was not super like high ranking or important at first, but he ends up getting to that position himself. The problem is though, when you get rid of your political opponent, you have to find an enemy somewhere. So, you know, when America has like an external enemy, we all get together and we sing God bless America and we love each other. And when there's times of peace, we start looking at each other and we start saying, wait a minute, what do you actually think? <laughs> and uh, Thanksgiving gets awkward, you know? We, uh, we find ways to turn on each other when there's times of peace. And so the Guelphs split into two factions, the Black Guelphs and the White Guelphs. And they would literally walk around the city with an armband, black or white. It was like a gang thing. And that's how you would be known. You were not just a Guelph, you were a White Guelph or a Black Guelph. Dante is among the White Guelphs. And for our purposes, the most important thing that happens in his lifetime is the Black Guelphs get the backing of the Pope and they expel Dante and many other White Guelphs from Florence. Now, exile was not an uncommon thing. Sometimes it would be a year or two and you'd come back, things would shift, you could kind of pay your way back in sometimes. Dante's exile is perpetual. He never returns to Florence. To this day, his bones are in the city of Ravenna. And there's this still constant problem for Florence trying to now get his body back because that's our Dante. And yet he did not die there. He was exiled from there. And the exile is what I would say ultimately leads to the Divine Comedy being written. This is a work of exile. Sometimes maybe you've experienced this, but you don't really see a place love a place, really sharply know a place until you leave a place. Um, again, I didn't grow up here, at least in my teenage years, um, but having left where I did grow up, you know, you just, you just see it different, you, you, but you're really interested in it. When you're there, you just want to get out, you know, or whatever. You say, I need to go to New York or whatever. Um, but Dante finds himself, he says, midway through the course of our life, finds himself in the opening lines of the first canto of the Inferno, which is the first of three books that makes up the Divine Comedy. Uh, he says, midway along the journey of our life, I woke to find myself in a dark wood, for I had wandered off from the straight path. How hard it is to tell what it was like, this wood of wilderness, savage and stubborn, the thought of it brings back all my old fears. And in the opening lines, you see someone who has been dislocated from, I mean, it's hard, again, probably to fathom. Um, but it would be everything you had worked for, everything you had gone to school for, everything you had done, maybe a career for 15 years. And then all of that was taken away. Extended family he will never see again. I mean, it's really, it's about as complete an exile and dislocation as you could imagine. Uh, in my earlier years, Stratton mentioned I taught at UCI. I also taught for certain seasons at community colleges like Saddleback, further down south. And I would teach ELL classes at Saddleback, and a lot of my students would be, um, would be Persian students who had left uh, Iran during the 70s, during the, the, the revolution, um, to flee um, the Ayatollah, etc. And so they would come over here, try to start a life, um, try to restart a life. And I remember one student, for example, my friend Farshid, um, he said, you know, I want to learn English. I need to learn English because I have to start, I have to start over in every way. And I go, oh, well, tell me a bit more about you. His wife, he had two daughters um, at the time. He said, in my country, I was a doctor. Um, but over here, it's not recognized. My training isn't recognized. My degrees aren't recognized. And so at the time, he was operating one of the, the jewelry carts in the Mission Viejo Mall, um, which, you know, was what he was doing because he was a hardworking guy. 
and um, he knew he just needed to do something, but there was no door open to him. And his English was rudimentary, it was, it was, it was basic. And so he and I would work on his language, but I, I found it astonishing that a human being could lose everything by just being somewhere else. Um, like he was a medical professional who had practiced for over 15 years and he was not allowed to do that. We didn't, that didn't exist as far as we were concerned because we didn't recognize um, those degrees. And, and so it was like a, I mean, his attitude was incredibly positive, but it was like, for me, I was just like, I couldn't even quite imagine what it would be like to be in your 40s or 50s starting over from scratch uh, with a family. Dante says midway through the course of our life. He's probably about 35. Um, the biblical lifespan is 70, and so Dante, usually using biblical references, is thought to probably indicate that he's around 35 years old at the time. For us, it'd be like 40, whatever it is. Um, so it's a material crisis. He, he loses everything. Um, he has no position. Uh, he has to start over in a lot of ways that are, again, sometimes difficult to fathom. But of course, because of that and other things, it's an existential crisis. Right, your whole life is dedicated to this or to Florentine politics. And guess what you don't get to engage in now for the rest of your life? The very thing you cared the most about, invested the most in, generationally stood for, um, cared about, it's gone. And so when Dante says he was lost in a dark wood, it's not because he's actually lost in a forest, it's because he doesn't know who he is anymore. And he has to figure out, if I built my life on these things and these things are gone, what is my life? Uh, I talked at retreat, maybe some of your students or uh, your children mentioned it or didn't, but I talked to retreat on building our lives on the rock versus building lives on sand. And the sand I mentioned in retreat is anything that could go away. Um, you know, a midlife crisis is usually a, a recognition of like, I thought I was supposed to feel like this when I got here. And that feeling isn't there. Um, I did the things I was supposed to do. I got the degree, I got the career, the family, I got the, the, the fence, the house, the place. And how could I feel this way? Um, it's an existential crisis. It's not necessarily a material crisis. But for Dante, it's a very real crisis. And he genuinely feels lost. How do you build or rebuild a self, um, an identity? Uh, maybe some of us have experienced that. I think all of us have experienced that in certain ways, usually, when something doesn't work out, or sometimes worse, when it does. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't actually last very long as far as its enjoyment or what you thought it was supposed to do. So Dante's crisis, his exile, is sort of absolute in those terms, right? It's a, it's a, it's a very serious part of his experience. And, and it leads to the writing of this. He, he places the experience he has or the vision that he receives, that he writes about in the Divine Comedy, he places it at that moment, the moment of his exile, around about the year 1300, maybe 1301. Uh, when he was exiled, that's when he has this experience. So he's not trying to be coy or, or subtle. Um, he's like, I was lost. I didn't really know who I was. And maybe importantly, uh, he's not just lost because he no longer has the political role or uh, play that he used to have, or even the family that he used to have, um, but he's a Christian. And he says in these lines, I had wandered off from the straight path. It's one thing to know, let's say with Farshid, that through no fault of your own, you've lost everything. It's another thing to be able to recognize in yourself, I wandered off from the straight path, that I actually made decisions that brought me to a different kind of lostness. And so his, his reflections that lead us into the Divine Comedy are not blaming someone else primarily, but are recognizing, I have wandered away from God and I need to find my way home. I need to find my way back. Um, so if we move to the ideological context, and I honestly, I put this up here because this is basically what your students will have absorbed by the time they get to me. And then I'll key it back up. So this is what they'll learn from Mr. Vincent. 
or Miss Shea, or Mrs. Hashimoto. Um, and then I'll key it back up because we go chronologically in the curriculum. So at this point, um, the ideology of the moment, I mentioned on this side here, but this is Christendom. Somehow, you have two authorities in the world, the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. Holy Roman Emperor, sounds very important. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor is the secular authority, the Pope's obviously the religious authority. They both have armies though. So it's not settled who's actually in charge of what, right? The contest is very real. And it, it plays into Dante's politics in ways I'd be happy to talk about more maybe another time. Um, but that ideology of that Christendom or Christian civilization is somehow fusing secular or Greco-Roman world and its values with Judeo-Christian world and its values and somehow trying to bring those together. The question mark is, is that possible? What are Greco-Roman values? Uh, personal greatness? Glory? Right? Um, your reputation is your immortality. Um, it doesn't necessarily vibe with Judeo-Christian values like humility, which in the ancient Greco-Roman world was basically a vice. Right? Humility would have been an appalling thing. It would have been a shameful thing. The, 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 the sort of the valence of slaves and people who were not born with excellence. Right? Um, pride was a virtue in the ancient world in a way that just does not land very well with Jesus' words, for example. Um, that you have to sacrifice, you have to give up yourself, you have to love others uh, and privilege them over your own ambitions, right? Um, so these two sets of sort of ideologies and values, we're used to saying that's the West. But that West is like completely at war with itself in so many ways, right? And we feel that, we like Dante would, we feel that in that we want to build a life, we, want, we have ambitions, hopes, plans, dreams, and then we read, you know, the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus is like, you know, you know, like don't do it that way, like seek the kingdom of God. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on heaven, you know, on earth, but, but seek treasures in heaven. And we're like, yeah, 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 but, <laughs> like I'm really motivated by being the best at whatever I'm doing, you know, like, so we're in our own souls, we're always wrestling with these two kind of ideologies, but they don't go easily together, I would argue. And you can see that play out politically with the Pope, with the Holy Roman Emperor, with all sorts of issues. Um, but it's just not obvious how to hold those together when the church and the state are one. When the church is somehow also involved with punishing criminals or, or, or the church is meant to sign off on or dub the next emperor. Um, it's just not clear how those lines are going to be drawn at any given moment when those two very different worlds and worldviews are trying to be held together. But that is Christendom and that is the Roman Empire turned into the Christian empire, right? That is that civilizational moment. Now, one guy who said, let me give it a shot, was Thomas Aquinas. Brilliant guy. They called him the dumb ox because he moved real slow and talked a little slow, and so people used to make fun of him. He must be slow. Turns out he was smarter than everyone who's ever lived, so he wasn't that slow. But um, one of the things he said was, like, we, can't, we don't have to get rid of the Greco-Roman thing. We got, like, Aristotle's amazing. Right? If you know anything about Aristotle, it talks a lot about habits, virtues, vices, um, how the only way you're going to become the person you want to be is you have to habitually do those things to actually develop that character. That, that's just true. And so Aquinas is like, eh, Aristotle's clearly right about so many things. So maybe I can put what he's saying together with Christian theology, scriptural understanding of certain things, and see if there's a harmony there. And Aquinas' theology is built by trying to hold those two things together. He does an incredible job. I mean, it's magisterial. It's also about that big. Um, the Summa Theologica, right? It's a massive work. And Aquinas was an incredible mind uh, and tried to put a, a world together that could try to harmonize these to some, to some rich extent. Part of that uh, inheritance, as I say, on both sides, is that there are virtues and there are vices. We may disagree on some of them. Um, but there is a way of structuring life that I think everyone can kind of see, and it can be really helpful. It can be helpful for students to see it, too. So these are the Christian vices and virtues, right, that Aquinas will lean into. Um, but vices like pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, sloth, virtues, faith, hope, love, wisdom, temperance, courage. At this point, you can just give up on what you're reading because it doesn't, it's not quite clear. <laughs> I usually start off strong and I'm like, I just, just hear my words, you know. Um, <laughs> um, but temperance, courage, and justice is what that should say. Um, this is like a way of thinking about how we live in accordance with the realities of God. 
right? Um, the way one lives reflecting what one actually believes. Again, if you are a Christian, pride is one of the greatest sins. That's what caused Satan to fall. So you, if you have that, you have to hold that. And you have to be like, ooh, but I feel pride every day, right? And so not knowing what category it goes in or not having some kind of clear picture is really difficult to live a life in which your world is shaped by two different ideologies all the time. So one of the ways you can navigate that is by just saying, okay, well, what, can we categorize something? Can we just name a few things? Um, and so this is one of, the, one of the things that we sort of uh, inherit from Aquinas. It also ends up being something Dante uses to structure his understanding of the afterlife. So the Divine Comedy is a picture of hell, purgatory, and heaven. And he structures hell famously around the vices. There's nine circles. He's, he adds in other things like being a traitor and uh, being a blasphemer and things that might not be on the, the official list here. Um, but he has nine circles of hell based on the nine high sins, right? And wherever you are in hell is wherever you were like known for what was your chief sin, right? So he also structures purgatory as the seven-story mountain. You've got to move up through your sins and purge yourself of your sins if you want to be saved. The cool thing about purgatory is everyone there is saved. Some of us, it's going to take 10,000 years to get to heaven, but we will get there. And others of you, you just like skip. You just skip along. It's like a year and a half and you're there. <laughs> like, you know, Mother Teresa or somebody's just like, oh my gosh, just one, two steps, you know, whatever. Um, but the rest of us are like, oh no, we'll, we'll hang on. You know, we'll be right there. Uh, but everyone there is saved. And so it is like, uh, I often tell students, Teenagers are drawn most to the inferno because it's insane. And there's a lot of people suffering in insane ways. And teenagers are like, whoa, whoa, this is crazy, you know. Um, uh, older people, uh, seasoned saints, are often like paradise. Just get me there, Lord. Take the wheel. I want to go home. So they're like paradise. I just want to, what does it smell like, sound like? How beautiful is it? But what's really interesting is when people teach the divine comedy in prisons, and that actually happens more than you might think. It's purgatory that the prisoners love the most. Because in purgatory is the promise that you can change. And they might feel like they're living in hell or that they've, they've been in hell, been to hell. But the idea that a human being at whatever point in their life could actually change, could find that path again and find their way home no matter what, no matter what they did. Everybody in purgatory commits the same sins that everybody in hell committed. They just have the blood of Jesus giving them that assurance of salvation. So it's an astonishing text. And my sophomores this year, we're going to read every single canto. And we're going to move through it in that way because it has a lot of hope in it. Um, so that leads me to my last place. Uh, Dante does not re-scribe Aquinas. Aquinas writes a beautiful theology. Dante writes poetry. My argument would be that literature or poetry is to sort of climb inside theology and walk around. Um, it's a way of bringing big ideas that may be very true, but you know as well as I do, you can hear a lot of true things and never change. So poetry, literature, it brings us into the, the realm of lived experience in a way that says, well, okay, if that's true, fine, but what would it look like to change? Like, what would it look like to find your way back? What would it look like to end up truly experiencing the love of God? Um, and so, his poetical, his, his personal, this is theology as literature. Um, because it's personal. John, Dante genuinely is trying to figure out if he knows God or if he can get home. He has been exiled from himself and from his God. And he's wondering if there's a chance that he can find his way back home. Um, so these are some of the questions I'll even float uh, to my students. Even after just a really robust, even technical or theological chat in class, where have I wandered off the path? I would ask you, where have you wandered <laughs> off the path? If anywhere, I mean in any way. Um, where have I loved or what have I loved more than Christ? Um, what have I built that was ultimately on sand? And then how do I find my way back? 
I would encourage you that the reading of Dante's Divine Comedy is much more than reading a great famous thing. Um, but if you really read it and engage with it, I would encourage you to do so prayerfully because it's very heavy, the things that are there. But I would say it could actually help you find your way back home. Um, and that's where I'll end my comments for 